Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Austin Beat Media Podcast. I'm your host, Austin Belzer. Today, we're celebrating the 45th anniversary of the sci-fi horror masterpiece, Alien. Jack Martin, editor-in-chief of Film Feeder, uh, is joining me today to discuss Alien. So, uh, Jack, welcome back to the podcast. Oh, well, thank you very much for having me back. Uh, I enjoyed our previous conversation about the holdovers and... uh, can't miss up an opportunity to talk about this classic. So, uh, yeah, I'm happy to get right into it. Yeah. Um, but before we get into it, uh, as always, um, is there any recommendation you want to put out there for a movie, TV show, music, album, anything like that? Well, yes. In in fact, um, there is, I'm, I'm sure as a lot of people have, at least in the United Kingdom, I've just binged the new Netflix miniseries, Baby Reindeer. And I've been uh, I don't a lot I mean, about that. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, it, it's it's a seven. So it's a seven part mini series. So there's only seven episodes, and it's based on the real life experiences of uh, Richard Gad, who's uh, a performer and a comedian. And basically, it's about him uh, dealing with uh, a deranged stalker that makes his just life just an absolute living hell, and it's. It's quite harrowing in the beginning. It's quite disturbing the relationship they have with each other. But then, as the series goes on, you learn more about this guy's past and kind of the rather traumatic stuff that he's been through and how that contributes to his own self sabotage. And by the end, honestly, I was just bawling. Like, uh, it takes a lot for any kind of media to really move me to the point of tears. And this one, um, by episode seven, yeah, I was just, I was just holding back tears, man. It was, it, it, it's, it's emotional. It, it's very dark, dark comedy, uh, but I do recommend it. So that's uh, uh, Baby Reindeer, which is now on Netflix. And yeah, and, and shout out as well, because uh, the first four episodes are actually directed by Veronica Tofiski. Um, I think I've got, I hope I've got the name right, but for those who don't know who she is, uh, she is also the co-writer for Rose Glass's um, most recent film, Love's Li- Love Lies Bleeding, which oh. is, uh, I think, still out in um, in American cinemas. It's coming out in the UK here next week in on the 3rd of May. But, um, so that's, that's kind of cool. So, um, yeah, no, that, that's that's my recommendation, Baby Reindeer. Awesome. I'll have to check it out. I you're probably the fourth or fifth person that's talked about it either on threads or wherever this week. So yeah. apparently I need, I just, that's a sign of the universe that I need to see this move. Uh, this. Oh yeah. This series? is like, yeah, this, yeah, yeah. This is a, um, this is a real word of mouth series. So yeah, it's a mini series, uh, only seven episodes. They're all streaming on Netflix and yeah, no, I, uh, I heard a lot about it as well. And I just thought, you know what, I'll give it a go, and I ended up streaming it over a day or two, so it's awesome. um, it, it's quite something, yeah. Yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll be sure to make it out. Seven episodes is good for a mini series for me, uh, especially if they're yeah. like thirty minutes. But yeah, they're about thirty. I think the longest one is like forty something minutes, but that's that, that's honestly nothing compared to uh, most other things. Yeah, I, I I can't do a docu series if each like seven. Uh, each of the seven episodes is like an hour. I don't know what it is. Oh yeah, no, it can get insane. <laughs> yeah, uh, but before we get too deep into docu series, I want to uh talk about Alien now. So yeah, um, I guess let's start with the most obvious question. Uh, what's your earliest memory of Alien? Uh, was it uh the first time you saw it or something else? Okay, so I I saw I the first thing I remember of Alien as I'm sure is with a lot of people, um, honestly, is the poster. Yeah, like it's a very iconic image, you know, that green egg out in space, that tagline in space, no one can hear you scream. I remember like uh, being like about nine or 10 years old and it's just, I saw that poster and it's just like, wow, that's a really creepy image. I wonder what that movie is all about. And it wasn't until much later that I first saw it. Uh, I think it was about to start um, uni or college and i remember being very impressed by how 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 kind of like slow burn it is honestly like yeah. uh, I, I know there are different versions of this i know there's like i think there's a director's cut out there somewhere mm-hmm. so and the version i watched in preparation for this uh I, i'm not sure if it was the director's cut or the original version either way it was the 
it's the version that's currently on Disney Plus here in the UK. But I, you know, watching it again just now, I was I remember remember thinking like, wow, there's a lot to really admire about how deeply detailed a lot of it is and you don't really pick that up when you're a younger viewer like i was when i first saw it but uh, i remember being very creeped out by it it was i think i got it on like um a box of the alien box set and uh just watched all of them here and there and then uh, of, of all of them i was most impressed by this first one which you know i think is the same with a lot of people yeah and i mean going back to your poster i mean you've got it in the bottom left of your zoom background so I mean, I, yeah. I feel like uh, there it is. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but yeah, it, it's interesting. I think the most uh, potent memory I have of Alien is, and I'll probably get um, hate online for this. Um, is I used to fall asleep to the opening credits. Um, okay. Like when I'd get really tired, you can just put on the opening credits of that, and you'll fall asleep like that. Now, to be fair, I think uh, Jerry Goldsmith's score that plays over those opening credits is quite soothing, yeah. albeit in a very salming kind of way. But I think, yeah, there's there's something quite peaceful about Jerry Goldsmith's uh, work on this. See, I, I, I completely see what you're getting at. Like, I think there's a very uh, lullaby kind of quality to it, which is weird to say about a very violent um, sci-fi horror film. Yeah, uh, because, you know... It was interesting because I put it on like four or five times. And one day I just sat down with the whole Alien anthology, which is I think what the box that's called. Um, I was mm. like, no, I'm going to watch all of them. Which interestingly enough, when I watched Aliens, um, there was like a, uh, I think there was like a transfer error, error where like the picture was off to dig through my photos and maybe I'll pop it up after I edit this. But uh, I took a photo where there's like blue and uh, red lines on certain parts parts of the image really um, did you watch it on dvd or blu-ray or blu -ray. online oh blu-ray maybe it's uh yeah maybe like you said maybe it's a transfer thing i i, I can't speak to the uh blu-ray uh or even the one that you had but um i've heard that i've heard that quite a lot you know there's a lot of uh 4k transfers which uh don't end up looking all that great i think there's one uh with i can't remember if it was like total recall or the abyss Realize. where apparently the um uh, the upscale quality, it, it looks like AI generated and um, it's caused a bit of a backlash by uh, some people. So I think there's a lot of stuff to look out, look out for with that. And I know how obviously how, you know, James Cameron is always about, you know, fine tuning his films many years after they come out. So that wouldn't surprise me if he did the same with or tried to do the same anyway with Aliens and it didn't quite work. Yeah, I think um, it was True Lies that was. Uh, the one that everyone was up in arms about with like the smoothing on the skin. Um, yeah. I think it might, no, I think it might've been Terminator 2 now I think about it. It, it, oh. it was a James Cameron movie. I, it, either, it was either Terminator 2 or The Abyss. I, I can't remember which one specifically, but there was a bit of an uproar about it. Uh, yeah. Um, because, yeah. Uh, because the a lot of James Cameron films just got re-released recently for those who don't know. Um, like Aliens, The Abyss, uh, Titanic, a bunch of ones from Disney. Um, I think even Avatar The Way of Water got a new release with new stuff uh, added. So, yeah. Um, but, um, but I watched the, for those who um, wondered, um, I usually watch the, I believe it's called the special, no, director's cut. Uh, I usually watch the director's cut, but today I watched the theatrical one because we're talking about, you know, that one, the director's cut came out in 2003, I think, and mm. Alien came out in 1979. So I'm like, well, if I'm going to rewatch it for the podcast, you know, just watch the theatrical cut, just hit play on Apple TV. Um, but yeah, um, but you know, um, I guess that brings me to kind of the legacy of alien which is kind of why we're here mm -hmm. every time i watch alien it's still as terrifying as the first time i've watched it so i guess the next point of discussion or the next question would be what makes a film like this alien so terrifying after you know 45 years this was released in 1979 so um yeah 
yeah, what what um what makes it so terrifying after so long and you know what aspects still surprise you after however many viewings well i think that there's um a lot to a lot to kind of uh, think about i mean i, I think first you got to kind of like put yourself in the shoes of people who saw it in 1979 i mean um, keep in mind this is like two years after star wars comes out which is like it was a real revel um film in terms of you know sci-fi uh, filmmaking and storytelling and then only a handful of years later for something like this to go on and and can really kind of go the horror movie route it's it is a slasher movie in space uh yeah. which is pretty much what it what it always has been but to really kind of um for, go from star wars which is all about you know exploring all this uh quite far-reaching and quite fascinating galaxy to just uh, showing the most terrifying um, creatures out there and imaginable that are capable of just uh, inhumane things. I think it was a very uh, significant uh, shift in like, um, oh, all this all this space stuff can be really cool, but then also it can actually be really terrifying. The unknown. Like it really kind of... Um, uh, puts puts you in the mindset of these uh, of the they're basically truckers like they're they're truckers in space aboard the ship good ship Nostromo and they are um, encountering something very unfamiliar they are encountering something that they have no knowledge of they don't know what it's capable of they don't even know it, it the its name like it's not even referred to as a xenomorph in the film until uh, I, I think it got that name in Aliens. And then the name in and of itself, you know, xenomorph, that comes from the word uh, xenophobia, which obviously is the uh, fear of um, fear of like foreign entities. And I think that there's, um, uh, you know, talking about how it how it kind of um, is still terrifying 45 years later. I think that there's a notion that there is a, still a fear of the unknown, a fear of not understanding other things beyond our own uh, cultures and um ways of life and i think it's um it's a real it, it's an interesting kind of um thing to think about when in terms of like today's politics you know which are increasingly um um xenophobic you know um in, in the uk as of recording this uh there's just been a, a bill that's been signed into law that's gonna deport some um migrants to rwanda which has been a huge issue over here but um and that, that's kind of what at least is that kind of xenophobic fear of the unknown and that's what something like alien really plays off of it's just that fear of not knowing what else is out there beyond our own mere selves. Yeah, I think that's probably uh, a better explanation of uh, than I could probably muster up. Mm -hmm. I was just gonna say because it like just looks cool, um, <laughs> because I think it kind of pioneered that or even evolved on. And I talk about this a lot whenever I review a horror movie um, about the creature behind the corner. You know. You don't know what's around because the uh, Nostromo is, you know, just so laden in black. You can't see anything um, to the point where, and you really don't even see the monster all uh, all that much, the xenomorph all that much in this film. No, except no. for like they, they, they keep it very uh, hidden until like the last few moments of the film, really. Yeah, and even then, it's happening in strobe lights. Hmm. Um. But yeah, I think that's kind of where I I would um, talk about it being terrifying after 45 years. Is I think the human mind um, just has a it has a natural inclination to not if it doesn't know things, um, especially like a threat. Um, I think it perceives like oh I better be on all, like all alert, uh, on full alert because something's around the corner and I don't know what it is. And thank you, Mac OS, for that reaction, apparently, that I forgot <laughs> yeah, to turn I off. Yeah, I approve. I approve this. <laughs> uh, um, no, I think I think that's a very um, good observation. I mean, there is there is something quite chilling about how the whole movie looks, because most of it is set on the ship, which is made up of long, really kind of dingy corridors. And there's a lot, there's a, like loads of cords um, just flanging all over the place, and there's dripping water in some areas. It's a very... It's a it's a very untidy ship, and 
like you said, again, it, it, it's it's that kind of like unpolished, very lived in kind of atmosphere. Again, uh, very much like the original Star Wars, which, you know, takes place in this very uh, kind of grungy area of the galaxy, really. And then by contrast to all the very polished and uh, very lifeless uh, stuff that the Empire um, in Star Wars does. But in Alien, that, that's where we spend all our time on it, even, even on the planet that they visit at the beginning. You know, it's it's made out in dark. You can't really see what's uh, going on because there's all sorts of like storms and uh, wind and rain getting in their way. And even like the glimpses of the ship, the big horseshoe ship, you know, they're very, um, it's mainly shown in like the, um, the grainy like uh, cameras that they have. And even then it's a sense of unease, even when something's right in front of you. I've, I always found that fascinating. Yeah. One second. Um, yeah, th that's a good point. You know, talking about the graininess and, well i don't want to talk talk about that because that's a spoiler for a video game but um <laughs> may, may, maybe we'll talk about that later um actually i i guess we can talk about it a little bit because that kind of goes right into what i'm what we're kind of already talking about with the atmosphere um mm. there um there was a video game that came out in 2015 i don't know if people have played it um that takes place after this alien isolation about 15 years after this with uh, okay. Rip Ripley's daughter. Oh, um, okay. I just wanted, wanted to ask uh, if you've played it um, at all, because uh, it's a very uh, similar atmosphere in the game. Uh, actually, no, I haven't played it. I, I definitely, I definitely have heard of it. I know that there's, um, there's a bunch of, there's a, there's a handful of video games about it. Mm -hmm. AC alien isolation. Like you said, I think there was one that was like, um, uh, based on the Marine Corps from Aliens. Um, yeah. uh, was that the one? I, I, I know there's a lot, and I, I think that one is particularly despised, or, or yeah. I think, am I, it is, right, yeah. I knew that one existed. I um, had heard about Isolation, but, um, yeah, I, I'm not really, it's probably Mario, but, um, and I, I, I know that it's kind of, I know that the, the impact of the film initially is spawned this entire franchise, you know, like, all these sequels and like there's even a television show currently in development yeah. and the video games like you said all the merchandise all that stuff and um i think very few of them from what i've seen anyway really kind of captures the um ironically the isolation of that first film you know because it is just these um just this handful of characters you know from Sigourney Weaver to Tom Skerritt and all the way to Harry Dean Stanton and because it, it, it's and there's no one else literally uh them and, and uh, the alien as well of course but, but um yeah no it's a very it's a very dangerous kind of creepy sense that they are kind of alone in the galaxy just with this deadly creature and I think um uh, a, a lot of them have just kind of like gone big or too too big or too philosophical or in the case of alien resurrection too ridiculous so i mean i'm i, I don't know i don't know if we're going to touch upon the sequels at all in in this episode but i think like a lot of um a lot of the ones i've seen again i don't know anything about the games uh but okay. i i know that there's um uh, some that try to replicate what the first one did and didn't exactly work yeah so then i guess so the reason I ask is it feels very similar. Um, but then I guess shifting back, uh, back to the movie, but um, I do recommend Alien Isolation. I've played it twice. Um, I've literally once got a heart rate uh, little uh, notification once that says that your heart rate's too high because I was playing Alien Isolation and got caught by the <laughs> Xenomorph. Oh um, my God. But going back to the film, um, mm -hmm. um, how do you think uh ridley scott's vision shape the alien film we got um versus the other you know alien films yeah. um well yeah i mean because again like all the alien films they've got their own uh distinct uh visual style uh, for better or worse and then you have the first film which um is is obviously ridley scott and um mem memory is failing me but i can't remember if this is like one it's definitely one of his first films i can't remember if it was mm -hmm. his no it can't have been his first um or, or at the very least one of his this is, this is early career um ridley scott anyway it was obviously before blade runner or yeah. anything like that but um 
I think it, it's interesting what he does here because I know that this film was wasn't made for a whole lot. Uh, of, I think for at the time it was made on a pretty pretty low budget. But and I think I think what he did is kind of um, really kind of made the most of that. He really kind of made all these corridors and uh, bright uh, areas like little uh, dining rooms and whatever. He kind of stand out. He really made them. Um, uh, characters in them of themselves which is you know as cliche as that is to say you know i think there is truth in that here because obviously there wasn't a whole lot of money involved to really kind of um expand on it more than it it, it had to be so i think that there's um a lot that ridley scott does in just kind of creating the general atmosphere like the, the opening scene for instance is a good example because it, all it is is just we're just uh, going around the ship you know nothing's really happening we're just kind of like it's just us there he's taking us on this little tour of all the areas that we're going to before you know um uh, the pods open and they all just kind of like wake up and um, get reacquainted with one another and i think it's a very it's a very ironically it's a very world building film in just a singular location like i yeah. think it's um it really kind of um, goes out of its way to make the make the sets stand out uh, more than they would have, you know, um, had it not been under the a watch of a very um, graceful director. Yeah, so I guess let's talk about that design language. Um, what did you, maybe this might be a redundant question, but what did you think of the film's design language, uh, like the biomechanical design of the xenomorph, the Nostromo itself being rooted very much i feel like in sort of that retro futurism vibe yeah no i think there's um there's a lot about the designs that are, yeah again they are very grungy they are very um um uh, kind of it's it's odd because like they obviously you have the alien first of all obviously a, a design by the late hr geiger and um you know that that design in of it and in of itself is very unique it's not like the um the little little green man you know with the big eyes and stuff no this is a very uh unique design you know with the coned head and the uh tongue that just kind of comes out of the mouth and it's a very um it's a striking design because it, it this thing doesn't even have eyes you, know, you don't even yeah. know how it sees let alone you know does everything else so I think there's there's so much to it that's um, um extremely fascinating that's not um not not intentionally not drawn too much upon because obviously that's all down to the the mystery but the design language I, again it goes back to that um that fear of um a, a fear of the unknown like there is so much to not just the alien but like the design of the ship itself which is kind of like bulky and very um oddly enough very 70s like uh, you, you get a lot of the uh you see like uh, characters just having very 70s haircuts and uh uh ways of talking or even the uh technology in and of itself is very like a, a 70s version of what like a uh, hundred years from then technology would be so it, i think it's kind of it's a mixture of of then and way in the future and i think that's kind of um i guess it brings it down to um like a relatability factor because i think a lot of people in 1979 saw all these designs and kind of like related it back to um how things were in their period like and i think that makes it easier to relate to some of the characters and uh and really kind of feel bad for them when they um get what's coming to them well, let's talk about those characters really quick Obviously, we have to mm -hmm. talk about Ripley. Um, yeah. What do you think makes her such a good protagonist that people are still quoting her, you know, what, 45 years mm -hmm. uh, in the future? Well, um, well essentially, because I think um, it's really in Aliens, the, 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 the next film, Fair. the James Cameron, that's the one that I think really kind of turned Ripley into this, like, um, 80s action heroine icon like uh she even got nominated for an oscar for that film of uh, that year and in in but in this film alien it, it's interesting because it's more of an ensemble film like uh, it's not i mean she's not even the top build uh person in the cast that uh, i think that's tom skerritt yeah but uh and i think there's um it it, it it's has more of a vibe of a slasher movie like she is the final girl ripley is the final girl 
in Alien, and she and but throughout, even before like all the carnage happens, like she is kind of pretty much the only one who sees common sense out of all of them. Like when Kane is, you know, when they bring Kane back to the ship, you know, after he's been um, attacked by the face hugger. And, uh, you know, she's the only one that says, you know, actually, this isn't a good idea. We need to, um, um, we don't want to risk uh, whatever it is coming on board and uh, thing. And she is, uh, she is fiercely committed to that, even after, you know, um, even after Dallas, you know, tells her, you know, you got to open the door. We've got to save his life. And she's like, no. And the only reason that anything happens in this film at all is because Ash is the one that uh, opens it up. The, uh, the, the snivelly little bastard. But um, I think, um, but but it, it really speaks to Ripley's character that she is so um, uh, she she's by the book, but in a way that kind of makes her like genuinely interesting. Like again, it's more you get that a lot more in Aliens than you do in Alien. But um, I think. This one definitely lays the groundwork for what Ripley will become. And it does so in a way that you really are rooting for her. And especially in those final scenes where she's just racing through the ship and trying to um get the uh get the cat and um you know avoiding the alien, you know, um on the on their way. And I think it, it's a very um it's a very fierce performance by Sikorni Weaver. It always is um, when she plays this part, but I think that uh, there's something in here that's a lot more vulnerable, and that makes it more um, terrifying because, I mean, at, at that time, I mean, we, we all know that she survives now because obviously she's in the other films, but back then, you know, there was no way of telling, like, maybe no one makes it out of this alive. Maybe this is just like a... Uh, um, this This is it for all of them, but... Ripley being the one to make it out alive is um is good because she is the most resilient one she is the one that uh, speaks the most sense and she is she has the qualities of a leader and I think a lot of people really um, look up to that they really kind of see her not not as not as any kind of female character in any way but they just see her as just a genuine hero like someone who does the right thing because it is the right thing not because you know she has like a an ego or something telling her otherwise, but she does it because, you know, she wants to help and she wants to um, kill kill these aliens. And uh, yeah, just, just really kind of, uh, yeah, I think that those are all admirable qualities that a lot of people see in her. Yeah, I mean, she's the one who talks to um, Ash and all the other crew members and says, hey, um, what are we doing here? Um, why are we allowing this thing that we don't know its capabilities of that has shot acid through three or three um decks of the ship um mm -hmm. well, and has a direct conversation with ash and says hey um why did you open that door yep. all right so let's talk um really uh let's talk about the franchise right because mm -hmm. 45 years is a long time to have a franchise you know and I, you know, talking about your alien and aliens um, timeline, you know, there's 20, I think 20 years between uh, sequels. And I think some important background info is this movie is getting released in theaters for the first time since Disney bought Fox. So I guess let's talk about the question. I think that's on a lot of people's minds of why it's important to re-release movies like this. You know, we're getting Spider-Man 2 this week which I'll, I'll have a podcast recording of um, very, very soon. Yeah, why is it important to re release classic movies like this? Oh, yeah, there's, I mean, when I mean, let, let's use Spider-Man 2 as an example, because, you know, um, uh, I, I'm sure you remember um, seeing that film uh, back then, uh, as do I. Yeah, I think there's, there's something so special about the cinema experience when you're seeing films that were only at one point ever meant to be seen in the cinema this is before like home video came along and streaming and stuff so literally cinema was the only place you could see all these things and i think that there's so much uh to gain from seeing films like alien with a crowd of people especially people who haven't seen it for the first time who are seeing it for the first time even it's a it's that sense of you know it's it's a sense of atmosphere that can't exactly be replicated at home like um 
that, that one specific moment that's sticking out in my mind uh, it, it's it's when they're going in to uh, check on Kane you know, after the face hugger has just kind of leapt off and has just gone into hiding it there's a shot um where it's just kind of low on the ground and it's just it it, it stays on the shot for a, a couple of minutes but it's the, all, all the um all the people you know Dallas and Ripley and everyone just kind of like going around very slowly a very it's a very quiet scene and then uh, I think I think something falls over and then that disrupts the tension or whatever. I remember because w- w- I saw this in the cinema um, a few years ago. I think they re-released it around Alien Day. Then I remember seeing that and uh, the, the reactions that I had that that were had with a lot all the rest of the audience. Um, some of whom had seen it before, some of whom hadn't. It was it was quite a terrifying moment, you know, because it's 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 a moment that's just filled with tension and. You know, when it, when it's in surround sound on a big screen, you don't know what's going to happen unless you've seen the movie already. Then there's um, a real thrill to be had with you know just uh, giving the reactions that the film wants you to have. Like because I mean because I, I saw it uh, for this podcast, I saw it you know at home, and which is fine, but you know you don't have that kind of like um, secluded nature, I guess. Yeah, like it, it, it sounds weird to say, but like I think. There's something about seeing it in a in a dark room with other people that really um makes it um worthwhile. And I think obviously I think everyone should be given a chance to see um any film on the big screen, you know, regardless of its uh, quality or origin, even if it's like a Netflix release. I do think that every film that's made uh does deserve a big screen treatment in some way because ultimately that's what films are made for. They're not necessarily made for computer screens or smart TVs, they are made for the cinema. I think really um, uh, make the, the fact that they are giving films like Alien and Spider-Man 2, like big re-releases in the cinema, really does speak to the power of that cinema experience that, you know, people just want to go out, have a good time, see a film that they may be familiar with or experiencing for the first time. And just kind of like generate that kind of sense that it, it once was in 1979, where they're just in a cinema watching all this stuff happen. And it, it's just, it can just be magical. It can just be a real magical experience. That I think everyone should experience at least once in their life. Yeah, for me, I think it would be a threefold answer. For me, the most important thing is, I think, reactions again. I also agree. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think it's threefold. It's um, first one is, you know, the picture quality is going to be a lot better um, since it's shot on film. Now, I liked seeing it on my tiny 4K monitor. That's, you know, it's a nice experience, but I'm also distracted by other things. I've got two screens, so I can look at the other screen and do other things on mm-hmm. it while I'm watching a movie, which I'm, you know, guilty of. Sorry uh, for those uh puritans out there that are like don't do anything else while you're watching a movie sometimes my adhd has me doing other things yeah no i I think as well yeah when you are at home there is the extra urge to just kind of like check your phone during the film like Mm -hmm. check on emails or see what's see what's happening on twitter or whatever but like i think in the cinema there's more of an etiquette like uh you're under you're expected to follow rules a bit more and therefore your attention is just fully on the screen. Whereas at home, it could be a bit more flexible. I think people might miss some particular aspects because they're busy on their phone or whatever. Yeah, which I kind of brings me down to that second one, is with, which is the audience experience. You might get different reactions. Like, I still remember the guy who bought out an entire row for Avengers Infinity War at the local Alamo Draft House, which those who have been to Alamo Draft House, you know that is not cheap. Like, wow, and it, that's that's impressive. I'm I'm not gonna lie. I don't I, I think I don't think the theater was 20 seats per row, but it was pretty close. So, mm-hmm. and that's 15 bucks a pop. So, Ooh. yeah, like dude bought out the entire row. But that's the kind of stories you get when you see something in a movie theater. Mm-hmm. And then I mean, I, as well, yeah, as well. Like there's that recent story, like someone was going out to see Dune Part Two like mm-hmm. uh, 10 times, and I think even legendary reached out to him and just like gave him some free stuff which is again you know if you do that in the cinema go out and do that in the cinema that's one thing but when you sit at home re-watching the same film again it's just like yeah you got you're gonna get your priorities in order you know but that's again that's something that 
only the cinema experience can provide. Uh, and um, he's doing it again for Challenger. I saw he tweeted nice. round one IMAX for Challenger. As, so, as, someone, as someone who just watched Challengers and just uploaded a review for it, I was just like, what a good, what a good film to do the next movie marathon on. Yeah, and as for the Dune part of it, I can confirm I've seen it at home. Still slaps it at home, but uh, not having the IMAX ratio is a killer for me. I I don't know why that decision was made, but I'll, I'll say more about that in my review, which I'll have up for the Blu-ray release. But I, I think the third thing is kind of just uh, not perseverance, but preservation uh, is the word I'm looking for. The more time something can be shown in theaters, even if it's like once a year, like on Alien Day, a April 26th, which is when the uh, 45th anniversary of Alien is, I believe. They might have contrived that. I don't remember the exact release date off the top of my head. But um, yeah, it, 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 is, it is usually around that particular date. And I'm not entirely sure. Was that the original release date? I, I never really I understood why April 26th. I don't know if it's significant. I mean, LV anyone listening, uh, feel free to. Uh, maybe or because I think reference to because I'm, I'm sure we'll uh, love to fit, love to find out. Yeah, I think it's reference to planet LV four twenty six, which is the planet they visit for the Xenomorph. So it might just mm. be that. Man, I'm a nerd. But yeah, <laughs> the more people times people can see it in theaters, like with this free release, I I think the more it kind of just stays in the, the culture. I guess is the mo as as I'm sure will happen this week you're starting to see more talk about alien now that you're, they're gearing up for the 45th anniversary and now people are talking about it again after four or five years of it not being able to be seen in theaters because of some rules disney made about 20th century fox movies being screened or re-released yeah that those are my three reasons and i i think also you know alien romulus is coming out i think this Year. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, meant to be coming out this August, I believe. She'll be, uh, in, I mean, I guess maybe that ties into the fact that, yeah, this has been like a, a franchise now for a number of years. So, like you said, starting in 79 and then going on to, you know, Aliens, the James Cameron one, and then Alien 3, and then Alien Resurrection, and then there was like a bit of a lull, and then Prometheus and Alien Covenant, both again by Ridley Scott, and then kind of downtime and there was talk about a tv series which i think is now happening and then obviously alien romulus which is going to be directed by Fede alvarez who did uh don't breathe and the the that that girl with the dragon tattoo sequel uh, i can't remember it, it, the bad one so um uh oh yeah he did uh the evil dead reboot from 2013 as well that's right um but yeah i i guess that kind of answers my question about how this film compares to the spinoff well well, I mean that that's an easy question right there. Um, it, there's there is no comparing. The original is is better in this case because and it's the same with I can say the same with all the Jurassic Park movies and the Terminator films and just like no matter what they try and do to kind of like spice up the formula, you can't you can't outdo the original. I mean, I think that's one of the problems that a lot of the Alien sequels have kind of um, fallen into is that they just try to just do the same thing but slightly different you know because like uh, aliens it, it aliens is a good sequel i I will give it that of the sequels it's probably the the strongest one oh, yeah, i mean sure. and, I, I mean I'm, i've never liked it more than the original alien though but i mean when you compare it to alien 3 which um honestly i i i know there's a lot of um um yeah a bit of a mixture towards it i know david fincher hates that film and he worked on it as his film debut and then honestly alien resurrection i i just couldn't do like i, I barely got through it it was it's it's the batman and robin of the alien franchise yeah yeah in so many ways and then and then i remember when like prometheus was coming out i remember there was a lot of hype towards it like it, it, you know this is ridley scott returning to the world of alien and gonna answer some questions that were raised in that first film and then the film comes out and a lot of people are very disappointed by it they would have preferred that you know a lot of the um stuff was kept a secret and honestly having re-watched the first film just now you know, I, I i kind of i kind of agree because when they do uh visit that big shoe a uh, horseshoe ship in the film and they come across that giant like statue with the weird like elephant kind of nose and stuff mm -hmm. 
because uh, so much of that is explained in Prometheus and thinking back on it, it is really kind of dumb how it all kind of ties together. And yeah. I, I just, I, I kind of, I prefer it just when it's just, it, things are just left unexplained. Some, 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 some things don't necessarily need a whole film to explain what Prometheus and then Alien Covenant, I don't really remember much about. So uh, just kind of goes to show how memorable that was. Right. So, um, yeah, I think yeah, overall, I think Alien is the superior one. There's no topping it, in my opinion, even Aliens, which I think is good, but never better than the, the original. Yeah, I have to agree. Um, although I do remember a lot about Alien Covenant because of how much I hated it. Like, yeah, I, I know I know a lot of people that dislike that movie heavily as well, like um, uh, shout out to um, Matthew Buck, who uh, some viewers, some listeners might know as uh, Film Brain. He did a whole episode on Prometheus and how it really, it, it really is, kind, it really does fail the entire franchise and stuff. It, it's a great watch. So if anyone does uh, ever want to see that, I'm sure it's available on YouTube somewhere. But he he really disliked that, and also uh, I don't think it was too keen on um, Alien Covenant either. And Again, I, I, I don't really remember it. I remember it being dumb, but like kind of like, oh, whatever, I'm gonna forget about it in a few weeks. And I did. So <laughs> I am and then obviously you have uh, Alien Romulus coming out, which um they've only just released a, a trailer for it, a very brief trailer. And it's interesting because obviously it's not apparently it's not in the same continuity as the Prometheus Alien Covenant timeline, but it does look it looks more like it's doing like a back to basics kind of alien style thing and i don't know what how it's going to turn out uh, it might just be a copy of the first film again but i, I hope not because i mean th there's got to be a reason why they've greenlit it other than you know just franchise wrecking but you know I, I do like fede alvarez for the most part i do like his stuff i mean i think don't breathe was a very effective horror i think that um the, the, the good cast members that Kaylee Spain is going to be in it is Isabella Mercer. And I think there's promise with it. I, again, I don't know how it's going to tell. It could be another Covenant. It could be another Prometheus. Who knows? We won't find out until August. But and then uh, again, there's the TV series that's currently um, being shot. So I, I, I think it might be in post-production now. Yeah. But uh, I, I think that's going to be um, coming to wherever it's going to be shown in the future. I think I'll fx i think I believe when, fx yeah i didn't i see i didn't know if it if fx was being folded because of because of the disney merger so um edit no it is okay all right so that that kind of makes sense so yeah i think it'll be on fx in the states i don't know where it's going to end up in the uk um uh probably disney plus I, i'm yeah. not i'm not sure but i mean that's where a lot of stuff tends to go um when it's like hulu and uh big uh disney own stuff anyway yeah alien any alien tv series that'll come out when it comes out i don't know when, but yeah um but yeah i i think the i'm really excited for alien romulus um because i it reminds me so much of alien isolation which is why i included a question about it because i'm like it there are shots where i'm like oh I have played that mission in alien isolation i know exactly <laughs> what's going on here to the point where i have some theories which Maybe I'll go into in a patron only post or something like that because there's some things where I think, anyways, um, that it could connect to alien isolation. But that might just be me drawing pins in a uh, dartboard that doesn't exist. And then, you know, obvi uh, obviously I'm excited for it because of Fede Alvarez. Um, uh, he got me into horror, um, like modern horror, um, because, you know, I'd watched The Strangers. Um, which is getting a prequel this year uh, called mm. Chapter One, which I plan to review all the entries th this year. And then, yeah, I, I, I saw Don't Breathe, and that was um, really cool for me. I uh, saw it in theater. Mm -hmm. And then Noah Hawley. I've seen some of Legion, which is his other FX show. So I'm really excited for that. I forget what it is uh, about. I just know it's like, the earliest in the alien timeline that you can go even before prometheus so um so yeah i'll be interested to see that but um let's get back to alien um proper let's talk a 
little bit of spoilers. So um, if for some reason you're listening to this and, and you've not seen this 45 year old movie, it's okay. Just come on back. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll still be here in your podcast player um, yep. of choice or YouTube if you prefer to do it that way. But uh, you've been warned. Let's talk spoilers. So Let's get into it. I think the biggest thing is that I want to talk about is theories about the origins of the distress call, the derelict spacecraft. You got any theories? Oh, you know, it's it's interesting because um, the, the, the fact that this whole thing kicks off because of that stress call and it turns out to be a warning. But um, it, it, I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of theories you can um, place with it. Maybe it's like a uh, one of those delayed um, calls, you know, uh, from the, one of the crew in uh, Prometheus or even even at a stretch covenant, but um, that, that, I don't know that, that somehow I feel, feel that's unlike, you know, I, again, I, I don't, I'm not, you, I don't know that much about the alien law. I'm just kind of free wheeling off the top of my head, but I think, um, I don't know. I think there's, an, again, like the, um, like when they visit that uh, horseshoe ship and they come across the giant thing, I think there are things that um, uh, are probably, left for mystery uh i think there are some things absolutely necessary but you know one of but you know um, odd odd place to compare it to but in in magnolia uh, the film at the end for the spo slight spoilers for those who haven't seen magnolia um th there's a climactic scene where it just starts raining frogs like out of nowhere you know it, it's just an absolute hailstorm of frond during that point it's um uh it, it's just it's just one of those things that just kind of comes out of nowhere and is already kind of like uh what what the hell's going on but and then i i look at that and just thinking like okay yeah this is just something that happens you know like this is just something that happens and this is how characters are dealing with it and i feel that's the same with alien and yeah no one i don't think anyone particularly knows where this distress call came from whether it's like from years in the past or if it's like another unfortunate crew that we never got to you know, maybe it's happening at the same time you never know um maybe it's all unfolding just before the Nostromo comes to that planet but I don't know I think there's um there's a lot of theories you can take and I'm sure there's a lot that maybe make more sense than my uh, rambling does but I think that there's um I know it's, it's it's all up for the bay. That that's all I'll say about that. Yeah, so I'll agree with your last point, and I'm of two minds about the origin of the distress signal. Um, because I remember Alien Covenant heavily implying um, that the distress signal uh, that happens in Alien is because David Ma Michael Fassbender's character, or Walter One, whatever name he had mm -hmm. at the end of the, that movie. I guess spoiler for Alien Covenant, but again, that's a seven-year-old movie, so <laughs> I, I feel like we're the statue of limitations have gone way, yeah, way fast. Think, um, yeah, I think again, like there's a certain like time limit. It's like if if it's like a film that was just released like two weeks ago, yeah, that's too soon. But like, give it a few years, yeah, we can talk about it freely. So yeah, I think you're I think you're off the hook for this one. Okay, cool. But yeah, like it heavily implies that he sent the um uh transmission uh, as a way to lure, lure the Nostromo, which they don't say is the Nostromo, but again, heavily implied that, you know, David's going to start, like, breeding the aliens in that little ship thing yeah. um, that you see at the beginning at in, in Alien. That's my first theory. Mm -hmm. Second theory uh, is, I think, lines a little bit more up with i think what ridley scott meant to do in alien covenant mm -hmm. and i think wayland yutani knew that um before they even sent out the nostromo because they talk about ash um being deployed like bef two days before this mission or something like that um and i think wayland yutani knew and gave ash orders like hey reroute the ship um so that you know you're on the path because you'll be like kind of 
you know, parallel to the path or something like that. I don't know. I think Wayland Jutani knew about like some kind of alien rumblings, like, hey, there's this specimen that we need to go collect, and the Strobo can kind of get you there, Ash. You, you as a Wayland Yutani representative, can go get it for us, but nobody can know you're an android until, you know, you die. I mean, there is that does kind of raise an interesting point. I mean, like, I mean, why, what would, uh, again, I don't know much about how the certain stuff about the in the alien universe. I don't know how it works, but like, I mean, what would have been the the use? I mean, would it have made a difference to you know just tell them outright, hey, I'm I'm a robot. I I have milk for blood for some, and I think um, I I don't know why that was necessarily kept a secret. I I, I guess that there's some kind of like um, racism, I guess, with yeah. robot kind because uh, I know that. In Aliens, Ripley's quite hostile towards Bishop at first, um, but I, I don't. I never knew if that was just like some uh, general bigotry or whether she, you know her experiences with Ash kind of put her off robots for life. But like, I, I, I don't know. That, that always struck me as a little weird. But but going what you said, maybe they it was all planned from the beginning. They you know Ash would join the Nostromo and um, steer them towards this planet under certain orders. Maybe it's involved somehow, but. Um, I don't, I, I don't know. It, it, it seems like there's a lot of um, there's a lot of steps missing in yeah. that theory, which is it, it, it's, some things about it in my head anyway. Maybe they make more sense in on when you actually really look at it on paper. For me, anyway, it doesn't entirely add up. Only because you know, just because you don't exactly know how close in advance, like Covenant and the first alien um take place so, um it, it's never really i don't think it's ever really explained again it's been years since i've seen covenant and i have no intention of re-watching it anytime mm -hmm. soon <laughs> i don't think many people do but uh, I, I think i don't know i think it, it's there's something about it that doesn't quite um doesn't quite add up i, I don't know maybe that's just me I, I the basis for my second theory is just wayland yutani is just like that and they'll just do whatever they can to get the thing that they need, um, as evidenced in Aliens, and even more so Alien 3 and Alien Resurrect. Because I think in Aliens, they basically say, oh, hey, we we need to murder this girl because of this. Um, or something like that. New, but Yeah, th that's like the thin paper I've written that theory on. Um, <laughs> it's just the... the the tendencies of Wayland Yutani being absolute dirtbags. How about the how about the role that Jones the cat plays? Jonesy, yeah. Um, Jonesy. I, I mean, I ahead. always found it weird that they had a cat on board anyway. I mean, uh, I, I can't remember if it was like in the pods with them while they were sleeping, but um, no, it, it wasn't. So if this this has taken like um, months, maybe even years to go, but like. How has the cat been surviving? Uh, that is okay. Like I get, I get the reason why they have well a cat cat on board, so they can literally save the cat in the last um, last act of the movie. But um, yeah, that, I think that's a lingering question. Just like how did that cat survive all this time while his owners have just been sleeping all this time? I mean, yeah, I, I'm sure there's lots of technology that can that can, like feed animals uh, uh, automatically, but at some point there's got to be a limit, like. That, that's either Jonesy is just um, uh, a very lucky cat, or or, he, or he's on his um, fifth life after the previous four. He just died of hunger, or um, or, or maybe he's the alien the whole time. Ooh. Mm. <laughs> that's the only explanation I could come up with how he's managed to survive all that time. He, even even like uh, when he comes across um, when he the alien like he just he, yeah he's in his like little protective box and stuff but the alien doesn't even like tear into it he just leaves him be it's just like hey i rec hey i recognize you you're from planet Zorblob, right um, or is it like the, the same breed of cat that was on like rick and morty it just like did a whole bunch of crazy stuff i don't know or, uh, the one that was voiced by Mad matthew broderick or uh lurkin from captain marvel oh yes that's a good one yeah that's that, that actually makes sense it, it, it actually does look like goose from captain yeah. marvel uh, I didn't think of that. <laughs> that would uh, like, be actually kind of funny. But, I mean, they they are technically in the, under the same uh, umbrella now, so yeah, it kind of makes sense. Alien meets uh, Flurkin. So get on that, Marvel.
Yeah, I I don't I don't, uh, actually, I don't honestly watch that. Actually, I think aren't there actually like aren't there also like um Marvel comics that are like Alien? Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I've seen like there there is like a comic spin off. I think I think it is Marvel that does them. So mm -hmm. yeah, technically Alien is in the Marvel Marvel universe. So that's kind of fun to kind of uh, think of, imagine up. So again, Kevin Feige, if you're listening, get on that. Yeah. And also, Santa Claus exists in the Marvel universe, so I, so yeah, I, 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 I would totally see Santa Claus like teaming up with um, I don't know, off the top of my head, but he's done that. that would be amazing. Um, he's like an Omega level villain, but uh, anyway, <laughs> oh, he's uh, a villain. Okay, Sh shows you how much I know about Marvel. I just, I just enjoy the films. Yeah, <laughs> that 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 uh, Santa is a villain. That's actually kind of cool. Yeah, but yeah. I, I don't know how Jonesy survives either. My cat doesn't survive three days without, like, when we come back, just screaming at us. To, um, even though her food bowl is just full, she's, if she sees any, like, part of the bowl of food, it's over. It's, she starts <laughs> screaming, even at, like, oh. three in the morning. Um, oh, no. Well, so, if he... If he can't last that long then god knows how long jonesy lasted until his his owners woke up, woke up again yeah with that said i think i think we've covered everything on but just about everything on alien i'm sure there's some obscure like bottom level iceberg thing that we haven't covered or you know the xenomorph suit being like an actual suit that had to be worn instead of you know pract um not practical effects but like cg um, or or the special effects for the ship being miniatures, kind of like how uh, Star Wars did it. I'm sure there's stuff we haven't covered, but um, but yeah, if we covered all that, I think we'd ha have a three hour podcast on our hands. And oh yeah, yeah, it'd, it'd be longer than the movie. So. Yeah, yeah. So um, with that said, thank you, Jack, for joining me in uh, in discussing Alien. Oh well, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, no problem. And uh, thanks to all you listeners, watchers, however you're interacting with this particular episode, uh, for listening, uh, for experiencing this podcast. Uh, if you've enjoyed this episode, uh, please subscribe, leave a rating, and review it on your favorite podcast app if it you know has a review system. And if you want to hear the next episode before anyone else, uh, patrons get early access, uh, 48 hour early access uh, specifically. Um, for as little as a dollar a month. Um, I'm going to have uh, a revamp up pretty soon. So that might go up. That price might go up a little bit. But pretty low cost. And you can follow me on social media. At Austin B Media on Blue Scott. Instagram, Mastodon, and Threads. And on and if you're on Letterboxd. I'm on there at, on there as Austin B Movie. Um, and if you have favorite memories with Alien. I'd love to hear them on social media or our, my Discord, which I'll link in the show notes, or the Patreon community chat. Where can people follow, uh, follow you, Jack? Well, um, I am on uh, Facebook and uh, Twitter. Obviously, I'm, I'm at Film Feeder. Instagram, I'm uh, Film Feeder Insta. Uh, so same on Threads. Uh, not on Mastodon as of yet, but um, also on Letterboxd as uh, just Film Feeder. I've been a bit more active on there, and I am also um, uh, relaunching my own podcast. Uh, for those who don't know, I used to do a weekly show, but that proved to be uh, quite time-consuming and uh, uh, put me under a lot of stress. So I'm just doing it once a month now, and I'm currently editing the first episode, which uh, will be all about my favorite film of all time, American Beauty. Nice. So I have, uh, yeah, no, it's. Uh, so we had a great discussion with a uh, special guest, um, uh, actor and producer Max Watt Dyke. And uh, that will be up, I believe, around uh, the beginning of May. Uh, I don't know exact dates as of yet, but um, so that'll be up very soon. And uh, again, I'm on Patreon as well, uh, patreon.com slash film feeder. I'm going to be uh, doing a lot more stuff on there. Like I'll be uh, opening up some uh, polls and... Uh, uh, offering some early sneak peeks at some artwork and uh if you want to follow me on there you know uh, you can uh you can do it from as little as a couple of uh, pounds a month or however much it is in dollars and, uh yeah it'd be just um great to have you on there and start building a film feeder community
So that's that's where you can find me. All right. Thank you so much. And until uh, the next episode, everyone. See you soon. See you soon.